Nobody made me feel worse than Shooter. Our little Waylon Albright was the light of our lives, as you might expect. I'd sing to him, and he'd just look at me so sweet. His mother would sing to him, and he'd start crying. I loved to rib Jesse about him looking more like me than he did her. He was our love child, the symbol of our togetherness. From the moment we brought his baby bed into the house, he was the golden child. He was a sensitive little guy, and he knew something wasn't right with me. Shooter's attention span was longer than mine. He'd be around me for a minute or two, and then he'd have to leave because I was so scattered. I think I made him uneasy. I was all screwed up trying to hold him and feeling like he was so little in my big old arms. I thought I could keep my drug use hidden around the house, but one day, when he was about three, he came in the room and found one of my straws. He picked it up and started sniffing on it. I didn't think he'd ever seen me do that. It really threw me. I don't regret cocaine. What's the use? There's nothing I can do about it now. It was part of the times we lived in, the songs we sang and the drugs we took. Who knows where one left off and the other started. We were having a fine old time. At least we thought we were. I knew how to live it up. I rocked and rolled on country and western time. Nobody could have more fun. I've always believed it's your life, and you can do whatever you want to with it. That is, if you're living in a cave like a hermit. But when it affects other people's lives, when you destroy their lives along with yours, you have no right to make them suffer. None. It got to where my music started to show the strain. I was doing bad records and missing shows due to laryngitis. Not picking up the guitar unless I was getting paid. And in general, just not caring. I was feeling bad. I couldn't get my breath and I was losing weight suddenly. I'd get dizzy spells at high altitudes. I'd be driving along and have to pull over and get out of the car. We'd be in Lake Tahoe or Aspen, and I'd turn to Jessie, grab hold of her arm, gripping her tight and trying to lean on her. We still couldn't talk about it. Jessie herself felt drained and depleted. She had been my rock for so long, and she was at the end of her waiting. In her gift of faith, she felt that she had been tempered by the Lord or she wouldn't have been able to pull back and have the patience to see us through. She had inquired about treatment centers and clinics and talked to John Cash about how he wrestled with his demons. I knew I was in trouble, and my friends and family had me cornered. Jesse understood that I wasn't the type of guy that you bag and throw in the trunk of a car and get committed. If you tried to make me do something, I was too stubbornly defiant. Strength or weakness, this heel digging probably caused me as much unnecessary trouble as it kept me from compromising my music. She saw that the spirit was willing, but my flesh was weak and getting weaker. Still, spirit can beat flesh, like paper covers rock and matches burn paper. Resolve only flows one way. At least I was heading in the right direction. I'm not going to quit. I'm just going to stop. I never say quit. I'm just going to get off. I'm just going to stop. This time, this is the time. I wasn't even aware in my heart that I'd made a hard decision until I said it aloud. I thought I would take off the month of April, clean up for 30 days, get my health back, my feet on the ground, and enjoy some looking for a feeling when I got back. I told Jesse I'd always be a drug addict and I'd always do cocaine, and that this was just temporary to slow it down. I leased a house in Arizona with the help of my old friend Bob Socorro, who was running clubs in Phoenix like Mr. Lucky's, and he owned a string of Bobby McGee restaurants. It was out in the desert, and I've always respected the spiritual purity of that stark land. Jesse's daddy had lived about 80 miles as a crow flies southeast of Phoenix, just below Superior and around the Ray Copper Mines. It was wilderness. He built a cabin along the Gila River, and in the morning you could get up and you could see paw prints in the sand where mountain lions and rattlesnakes and wild boar had been. I'd go there to taper off drugs, and it seemed to help. The desert would soothe me. I could exist without stimulants for weeks at a time, drawing on the desert's silent company. You'd better respect the desert because the desert leaves it up to you. It's not going to help. There's nobody you can pay to find the answer and bring it to you. You can't sit back and wait on it. The desert is going to leave you totally alone. 
to see if you can find the strength within yourself to survive. There are no distractions. You can't outfox the desert. You'll die trying. On the night of March 31st, 1984, I did all the cocaine I could and left $20,000 worth on the bus. I didn't think I could handle withdrawal without an escape hatch. Though it must have been frightening for Jesse to know that drugs were just sitting out there, just waiting for me to have a moment of weakness. I parked the bus in a circular driveway and prepared myself to wait it out. A doctor would come by and give me a vitamin shot. Otherwise, I knew I was on my own. My body reacted as if someone had pulled the plug. I had sudden convulsions. It was like I was caught in a revolution, with snipers on the rooftop and battles being waged on every corner. My nerves were in a constant grind of readiness, waiting, every cell about to explode in anticipation for some relief that just wouldn't come. My bones hurt. I didn't sleep. I'd wake up at all hours of the night with toxins pouring out of my body. I really got sick. It was the first common cold I'd had in years, as my body flushed out the cocaine residues. I'd sit out on the swing in the front yard, watching the sun come up, and I'd still be there sometime when the stars began to shine. As my mind started to clear, I got to see in the look on Jessie's face. It was helpless and hopeless. She was really sad watching me go between life and death and unable to do more than just watch me go through it. I realized then what I was doing to her, that it wasn't just me that was under the influence of cocaine. And then I looked around at everybody around me who cared anything about me, and basically, that same look was on their face. For two or three weeks, I learned how to feel my emotions again. When you're normal, you can give as well as receive, but on drugs, it's all inward, and you never let it out. I woke up one morning toward the end, and Jesse was sitting there by the end of the bed. I'd only been asleep about ten minutes. Jesse... My spirit's dying, and there's nothing I can do about it. There wasn't anything she could do but wait, pray in her fashion, and let me know that she was holding on fast right by my side. I couldn't have done it without Jessie. She is the most giving person I've ever met, and any time that I felt like I just couldn't stand it further, she let me know by her gentle presence what was waiting for me on life's other shore. There was a grand piano in the house, and she sang from a big Reader's Digest book of old songs that was on the music stand. We went for short walks, and I clung close to her. She knew I needed someone to be my partner. Shooter played in the front yard, and I watched him as I sat in the swing, knowing that he was my greatest inspiration. After about three weeks, I got to where I could sit for a time and feel my mind clearing out. I realized that's the end of it. I waited another day or two to make sure about what I was thinking, though I still felt that I had only stopped. That was my key word. I was in the car with Jessie one afternoon, watching the desert scenery go by, and I turned to her and said, Does so-and-so know I've quit? And she stared at me. I realized what had just come out of my mouth, and I didn't believe that I had said that. Did you hear me? I asked her, though I was really directing the question at myself. It had come from deep within, and we both understood it was absolutely true. I wasn't ever going to do drugs again, as amazing as it sounded. I had painted myself in the corner, and when I give my word, I don't break it. A month after entering my own halfway house, I walked out the door slightly shaky, but feeling strong, at least physically. I was anxious to see what life was going to be like, though I didn't dwell on the mental hurdles that were sure to come. Back on the bus, there was still that $20,000 worth of cocaine waiting for me. The last temptation. I really didn't want to deal with it, and I wasn't about to pass along my troubles on somebody else. I was worried that we might have a wreck and it would be found, and they would try to bust me, not knowing I had quit. I went in the back, unearthed the briefcase with the coke, and took it to the front of the bus. I handed it to Jesse. I said, you of all people deserve to do whatever you want to with this. She went to the bathroom, poured it in the bowl, hollering hallelujah. She was the happiest little girl in the world, and I was a pretty happy old boy. Every once in a while to this day, I'll run into one of my hidden stashes, 
a vial tucked in the corner of an old suitcase, or an inch of cocaine buried in the bottom of a boot bag. Even now, my first instinct is to pick up a straw and snort it. The temptation does go away, although when it comes, I don't ignore it, and I don't get mad at myself for thinking it. I'll say, man, it would be great to get high just once. Jessie's heard me say that a number of times. She knows what I'm doing. It's on my mind, and I'm spitting it out. It lasts about 30 seconds, and then I go on with my life. I was sitting with Shooter in a restaurant booth. He was on the inside. He got out his coloring book, and he was all of about five years old. He put his left arm through my right, and we sat there for about an hour while he colored. Now, Shooter had never done that before. I'd never been able to sit still for that long with him. I wasn't about to move my arm. It took me eight years to find my way back from drugs, to rediscover the creative tension in my music, the sweet spot balanced between rhythm and melody where the song generates its own momentum, and all you can do is express it. Eight years to be able to write a song. Eight years to be on stage and not feel that I was born people sick. Eight years to figure out who I was again, to get over it. Eight long years. Now, that's not to say that the work I did during that time didn't have any value. I made some good, decent records, and I always sang from the heart. I had better notes now that I wasn't plagued by laryngitis. I played on the beat instead of ahead of it. Probably only I noticed that instead of pushing myself, I was being pulled along by my own legend and the skills that I'd learned in a lifetime of performing. Even stars have stars. Now, I'll be the first one to start leaving when you start talking about legends. I'm really not comfortable with that. But that doesn't mean I don't have legends of my own that can turn my knees to jelly and my mouth into a silly grin. Ernest Tubb always called me son. That meant he liked me. I sang on an album of his once, though he wasn't there. They had his voice on the tape, and at the part where I was supposed to come in, he'd say, Aw, oh, sing it, Waylon. I melted. I got so taken listening to him say my name that I forgot to open my mouth. It made me feel like I was a kid again in the back room of Grandpa's Cafe, squeaking along to the jukebox and holding my broomstick for dear life. Ernest Tubb was my hero. Now, he wasn't my role model. He drank pretty good and probably had his faults. But I don't think entertainers are cut out to be role models. I have a hard enough time being a role model for my child. Your kids shouldn't have to look up to me. They should be looking up to you, their parents. Now, don't put the responsibility on me, though I would never do anything mean or dishonorable in front of a kid. I have all the respect in the world for young minds and open honesty. A hero is when you feel honored to have been in their presence, to have crossed their path. When Hazel Smith brought Bill Monroe over to the Honky Tonk Hero session as a surprise, I tried to be calm, but I felt my hands sweating and I was shaking. My dad had Bill Monroe's picture on the wall at home. In our house, it was the flag, the Bible, Bill Monroe. Sometimes Bill Monroe was first. I think of that whenever I'm asked for an autograph. You get it back, seeing yourself in other people's eyes. Tom Paul and I set up a booth at the fanfare one year. That's the annual Nashville meet and greet for the hardcore country fans. It would have been better if we just played and jawed and people watched us. But instead, we decided to sign autographs. A little blind girl walked up to me. Is it really you? She asked. Yes, it's me. Can I touch you? And she reached up and took hold of my hands. She held them real tight. Then she put her fingers up to my face, tracing its outline. Her own face was showing me every feeling she's having, the realization and the wonder and the joy combined. From her blind eyes, she saw me. Tears were sliding down her cheeks and mine. 